Hello, everybody. Welcome. <clears throat> Today is Sunday, March 6th, 2022. I'm living in the far, far future of my childhood. And it's an extremely strange time. And part of what's weird about it is the aspects of history that have been preserved and the aspects of technology that have advanced while many other features of our potential future in my childhood have declined. There are so many elements of our societies that crystallized into relatively crude or clumsy forms And then we have these other features of common modern human experience that have advanced so rapidly and continue to do so, particularly what we refer to as our technological abilities, that we're blinded by the noise and shock and brightness and hue of the results. Unfortunately, we never crafted societies capable of making intelligent use of the technological advances that humans have achieved. And so, what we get are very dangerous implementations and toxic implementation, at least for the moment. Um, it's my perspective that there's a, a profound sea change occurring. And it's been occurring for a long time, but I would say over the past five years and maybe the past three particularly or four, It's become blatantly obvious. Something fundamental has shifted and continues to shift. And it's not just one fundamental thing. Many of them are linked together and as one changes, the others change in response. And I've spoken in previous videos of there being something wrong with the time. Something in the essence of time has changed and something in the essence of being human has been affected by this change. And it's extremely likely that the humans have a causal role if they're not the single cause of some of these transformations, but there are seasons of transformation in the terrestrial sphere, in the sphere of the solar system and the sun, and probably in an extended way in time space itself and particularly local time space. For the past couple of months I've paid nearly no attention to the news. Um, and that's been kind of a relief. I'm modestly aware of the situation in the Ukraine, and I have great compassion and love of the Ukrainian people. Um, 
military adventurism is one of the fundamental diseases of our modernity, but it's been with us for a long time. <clears throat> and the superficial specter of the pandemic has created a situation where Well, it's created a spectacle, and the spectacle, in the Debordian sense, in the Situationist sense, is a feint or a mask, an occlusion. When, there's, when everyone's looking in one direction, opportunism blossoms, and most of that opportunism is going to be malignant. In our own lives, in our personal lives, we have the capacity for the opposite of malignant opportunism, beneficent opportunism. And this gives me hope and is part of my own day-to-day -day life. We're sharing together in the very strange features of the epoch in which we now live. And many of us have suffered incredible losses and pain and fear, confusion, anger, frustration, the shadow aspects of our human nature. But these are also natural aspects. I continue to observe with great curiosity and fascination the hidden underpinnings of the transformations that we are now experiencing and that we will continue to experience as futurity accelerates and diversifies its modes of acceleration around and within our bodies. <clears throat> So I've had a topic in mind now for a couple of days. I was walking home the other day from a visit to the ophthalmologist in which I got to see, I kind of ironically or recursively, a photograph of my own optic nerve. So that's a pretty weird thing, right? You're, my eye is seeing a photograph of the biological structures that catalyze seeing. <laughs> so in a way, I'm seeing one of the most crucial elements of that with which I see. A simple version of this is just looking at one's own eyes in the mirror something that we take for granted, but something that was nearly impossible for most of human history. We might be able to have looked at our eyes in the water or in some other shiny surface, and certainly some civilizations over the past couple thousand years had something resembling mirrors but they were never ubiquitous. They were never everywhere. And for most of us, they're everywhere. And not just mirrors, but cameras. Um, cameras are not mechanical eyes. Cameras are machines that simulate an aspect of seeing. 
But our eyes are not cameras. In fact, our eyes are organisms. And our bodies are a collection, a diverse ecology of organisms. There are no machines in the body, um, granting the exceptions of things like pacemakers or perhaps a glucose pump or an insulin pump, excuse me. <laughs> With glucose pump, all we need is a can of Pepsi. <laughs> So, I've been thinking a lot about topics long familiar to me, particularly language, knowledge, and intellect. <clears throat> and recently, I was listening to a podcast in which Sadhguru was talking with a neuroscientist. And the neuroscientist was asking Sadhguru questions about his understanding of the brain. It was a sophisticated conversation, but it was lopsided because the neuroscientist is thinking about things mechanically and from a very utilitarian perspective. meaning that things and parts of things have functions and uses, and knowledge purportedly empowers us to improve things <laughs> and functions and such. And so the neuroscientist was very concerned with utility. And I can't remember Sadhguru's precise words, but he said some things that I will echo in my talk this evening. He said, why do you think things have uses? And how will you understand the brain if for you it is just a collection of functions and machinery, organs and tissues and nerves and neurons and so on? And you know, in his <clears throat> curiosity, the neuroscientist was playful and uh, was kind of joking around a bit with Sadhguru. And Sadhguru was also playful. And that's a nice feature of a conversation. But Sadhguru was pointing at something very fundamental. And what he was pointing at was the incredible limitations of the idea that things and beings and processes are useful. And he said, you know, the tree is doing things, the donkey is doing things, but they are not functions. their beings. And the idea that beings have uses is very dangerous. This is an intellectual idea. And he talked about the intellect, and he said, you know, something I've long understood, actually. The intellect, which we don't want to do away with it, but also we do not want to be dominated by it. The intellect is a knife. It cuts things apart. It puts divisions between things and tells us how to distinguish one from another. And that word distinguish is important here because we have another very similar word, the word extinguish. You know? And what happens when we begin to become dominated by the intellect and by naming and by classes and categories, well, <laughs> all kinds of trouble ensues. Um, one of the worst problems is, is relatively superficial, and it is that we confuse the class and the instance. One might hear, 
for example, someone saying, oh, you know, those people over there are stupid. Well, have they met any of those people over there? Are they in a conversation with them? How did they determine that the entire class has this quality? Yet this is natural to the intellect, for the intellect, it grasps, it, it grasps a single thing at a time. One thing. And rarely does it grasp two things at, at a time. And ordinarily, it's doing this very clumsy misapplication of scope activity all day long, so it just becomes fascinated with its own misapplications of scope and sees them as real and true and trustworthy and sometimes irrefutable. Um, and this is very unfortunate, for in such a situation it becomes impossible to be intelligent. <clears throat> and often we equate intellect with intelligence, especially if we measure, for example, intelligence quotients or something like this. <laughs> um, and the problem there is that there are myriad aspects and forms and inactions and embodiments of intelligence. Trees are fundamentally intelligent, but they are not intelligent in the way that representational cognitives like humans are intelligent, in that specific mode of language and categorization and naming. In fact, they may be much more intelligent than us because they are free of that. Because they do not do that, they can do many myriad other things. They can be in myriad relationships and sense them and transform and change the world in their local environments and all kinds of things. And bees are profoundly intelligent organisms. But, and, and they have some capacity for something resembling an aspect of representation, um, but they don't have formal representational cognition the way that we humans do. FRC. And what I mean by that is that we name things. And we have categories and classes and instances, and it's a set theoretical framework. Um, naming language and what we think of as knowledge, all of these are based on something resembling but superior to ordinary set theory. And this is why I sometimes talk about holophores, root concepts, that if you change one of them, all other concepts change. If you transform what you understand a tree to be, all other concepts will change. And if you transform it poorly, effectively, the result is stupidification. And if you transform it adeptly, you get a beneficial result. And the reason is that for this, the reason that all concepts are affected by our ideas about fundamental concepts like space and time, or the sun, or a dream, or a friend, or food, is that the entire web of concepts is like a linked system of mirrors. So if you change the qualities of one of the mirrors in the system, it affects all other mirrors, and possibly even qualities. And this is part of what I dream about when I dream about what I call cognitive activism. Our capacity to learn to understand the dangers and opportunities presented to us 
in our relationship with formal representational cognition. So the other day, somebody's got a peach tree. Why would it have peaches on it already? Mm, maybe it's maybe it's a fragrance and not a being that's making that scent. So, the other day I was walking home from the ophthalmologist and I was speaking with someone very close to me. And we were talking about uh, ideas related to Vedanta. Mm. Or ideas that emerge from the study of the Upanishads. And it was a wonderful conversation. Um, and I've long been aware but the intellect is a very dangerous knife. It's possible to use the knife with wisdom, but it's very uncommon. Few of us learn to do this outside of very specialized fields like physics or mathematics or biology or poetics or music or dance. Um, and someone might say, well, dance isn't intellectual. Yet the intellect is involved in a peculiar way. Dance could be understood in some situations as an escape route from the domination of the intellect. And so they are related. And I've seen mixtures of intellectual art and dance. And there is very intellectual poetry, particularly um, the language school of poetry. Uh, but there's also wild lyricism and all kinds of beautiful, diverse embodiments of the potential of poetics. And it's not merely our intellect with which we understand these. If we do, poetry is lost on us. As to is music. I remember someone telling me, when I was little and I would listen to songs on the radio, I would only hear the lyrics and I would try to figure out what the song was about. And this is a very cognitive way of having some relationship with music. For most of us, intellect traps us in a very narrow scope of our capacities for understanding, awareness, development, the transformation of our minds and worlds. And we can see all around us the results of certain forms of inaction of intellect that produce very dangerous technologies that are advertised as conveniences and yet dominate life on earth and mostly destroy it. So as we were talking, I, I had an ironic insight, not unrelated to <laughs> the idea of having seen a photograph of my optic nerve. <laughs> um, and although I've understood this for many, many years now, perhaps a couple of decades, it never occurred to me, I, I never formulated it the way that I'm about to say it. And it may seem um, less than explosive when I say the simple thing I'm about to say. But I often wondered if intellect divides things, what brings them back together? What does the opposite thing? And I'll get to that in a moment. 
So I'm going to return to the doublet of distinguish and extinguish. And I'm going to return to it via one of the early stories in Genesis that has fascinated me throughout much of my life. The story of the problem at the tree. And I've spoken of this many times. And I'm still fascinated by it. Because I feel that it's an archaic encoding of a fundamental issue that ramified over thousands or tens of thousands of generations of humans places us in a terrible crisis from which it is extremely difficult to escape, particularly as a people. Individuals sometimes escape, and in, in the West we refer to this as enlightenment, but in, in the East it's understood in a far more nuanced and subtle way. But something happened at that tree. Right? Something went terribly wrong there. A great danger was introduced. And it might have been no more than the danger of being capable of naming something. Of saying that is a tree, and that is a rock, and this is my foot, and that is the sky. Because once you have names of things, now all of the set theoretical structure emerges into relatively explicit existence in our mind. And we all underwent this process as children. This isn't merely something that happened before the humans were human in in the twilight world between origin and material existence, as we may imagine the story to take place. No, this is something... The story is, a, is about something like that, right? It's about the between, um, I think. <laughs> I suspect. But it can be taken in, in different ways for different purposes. And this is one of the powerful things about that story. In case you don't know it, I'll reiterate it briefly. Um, the being who dwells in unity was speaking to what we might imagine to be the protoforms of humans. And they were in some kind of world. It may or may not have been a material world. It may or may not have been this world. And according to the texts that have come down to us, the being who dwells in unity spoke to the two human children, Adam and Eve, and said to them, of all the trees in the garden you may freely eat, except the tree in the midst of the garden. But this word midst does not necessarily mean middle. It probably means <laughs> where the world was put apart from the world of origin. And at that place, there was something like an umbilicus or a tail. And at that umbilicus, there was something resembling an angel. An angel being perhaps like um, a unique aspect of the inaction body of the being that dwells in unity. And this aspect cuts things apart. It parts them. And by doing so, it can be said to be a creator. Right? Because by cutting the world apart from the, from the universe, it creates the world. And so, the being who dwells in unity instructed the children, don't go to this tree. Bad things will happen. But what was the bad thing? Well, why was it called the tree of knowledge? Possibly because intellect extinguishes slowly the ambient and natural sense of the unity of all beings and situations. Communion. 
what gets extinguished by, by naming is relation. Someone thinks, oh, those Chinese people are doing X, Y, and Z. Oh, those Russian people are doing X, Y, and Z. <clears throat> They're not in relation with the people. They're in relation with the concepts, the names. And so knowledge in its way, the, the knife of the intellect, extinguishes the sense of communion that's natural and precedes it. And we all underwent this as children. Um, we underwent the complex processes of enlanguaging and enculturation with which we developed minds that can think in terms of concepts and names and processes and um, distinguishable elements of relation and so on. So something gets extinguished when we acquire the strange problematic ability that we have with language, naming, and knowledge. So what is it that has the opposite power? What is it that reunifies and returns to us the sense of communion in relationships? It is this insight. What the humans think of and make cartoons about is a light bulb moment <laughs> in a very crude way. Right? When, the, when a light appears above one's head it's a, in the cartoon version. <clears throat> and insight prevails. And what happens then is that things that were previously diversely distinguished from one another, are now understood in their proper relation. Or proper is probably the wrong word, in a better, in a wiser, in a more intelligent and more aware way. One of the most famous insights in our time in physics was the insight contributed by, to by many people um, that Einstein encoded <laughs> in a very concise way with the equation E equals MC squared. Um, and I think we might, I think the simple version of this is probably incorrect. Um, because unless I have misunderstood my friend who deeply un more deeply understands physics than I, it's important to put the square root of negative one on either side of this equation. But I don't understand that well enough to explain it to you. <clears throat> of course, we have the problem of being able to name energy, matter, and what we refer to as the speed of light, I don't actually believe it's a speed at all. Um, I think it's something else. But this insight integrated and showed the relationship between things in a way that we could make use of mechanically, unfortunately. We could, you know, utilitarianly enact with things like atomic physics or nuclear physics. Very dangerous for us poor humans and all of life on Earth. Led to the detonation so far of at least 2,500 nuclear weapons. A full-scale nuclear war known as nuclear testing. <laughs> so the problem, however, is even though we have much more concise definitions for these elements, energy, mass, equivalence, and the speed of light squared, no one knows what energy is. No one knows why there's mass. And no one knows why 
the speed of light has the properties that it does or why light acts certain ways in certain experiments like the double slit. <clears throat> you see, we have these names, but we don't know what they are. And this is the problem, right? This is a huge problem. We can name energy. We know approximately what we mean by it, but we don't know what it means. We can name mass and know approximately what we mean by it, but we don't know what mass is for. What does it do? Why is there mass? And again, you know, one could say, well, we've made great progress in the past 75 years in coming closer to understanding, <laughs> except th these topics are infinitely deep. So coming closer doesn't help us a lot, and we're still confused by the fact that we refer to transcendental features we have distinguished in naming and language with tokens and symbols and words and equations. Nonetheless, insights are what weave back together what intellect first divided. And the fundamental insight <clears throat> or the is probably the wrong word. There are a variety of fundamental insights that orbit the nature of the universe, light, time, birth and death. What is a being? Why are there beings? What is the world? What is the sun? All of these things. But these fundamental insights rarely arise for individuals except either by happy accident, um, long fascination, or extremely strenuous practice, primarily the practice of meditation. So, the fundamental insight, the nature of fundamental insights, is that they, they unify the entire field of knowledge. They take all of the things that were cut apart by intellect, integrate them, and rather than explaining them, deliver a direct experience of their nature, character, origin, activity, power, grace, beauty, ecstasy, emptiness. That last word is commonly used in discussions about enlightenment. We hear about void or emptiness, but it doesn't mean nothing. And nothing is one of the strangest concepts in the entire language. If we understood this one token slightly better, our capacities for insight and intelligence would be radically transformed and perhaps improved. Now, of course, one of the problems with intellect is that it seeks to improve things. And someone who's close to me recently said, I, I think I mentioned something that, that I, I found frightening, and they said, that's nothing. What frightens me is when humans decide they're gonna improve something. Now we have a problem. And I laughed um, with the laughter of insight. Right? Because that's hilariously true. Hmm, I smell that same fruit in another place, so I don't think it was merely... It must be blossoms. I must be smelling blossoms. <laughs> Intellect seeks to improve, but the scope of its awareness is so narrow that it usually results in catastrophe. The encoding of E equals MC squared led to the capacity for modern nations, and whatever those are, it's something terrible, to produce nuclear weapons. 
how tragic it is that such a fascinating insight would be so terrifyingly enacted. So, this emptiness. You know, in the, uh, in the Heart Sutra, where Avalokiteshvara is speaking to Shariputra and transmitting to him in a kind of a song a miraculous catastrophe of insight. He says, all things are essentially empty, not born, not destroyed, not stained, not pure, without loss, without gain. And a number of other things. And part of what Avalokiteshvara is trying to communicate is that our sensory experience is a kind of a dream and our waking world experience dominated as it often is if not completely deeply by intellect and categorization and class and set and instance is a mode of dreaming and that what's actually going on is formless and inviolate, eternal, incomprehensible to the intellect, but available to the direct experience of human beings. And this nothing, this void that is often referenced when words like this are used, it might be understood as something like undifferentiated potential. I often like to put the word pure before that phrase, but this time I won't. I, I like the word pure, but I think there's probably a better word. Um, I'm at a loss as I stare at the night sky trying to find a better word than pure undifferentiated potential. Mysterious might be better. Mysterious undifferentiated potential. The before of form. The before of thought the before of being, the before of matter, the before of universes and gods. That from which all experience emerges as a peculiar aspect of its progeny. By saying all things are essentially empty, the implication is that all things are inviolably unified. And nothing is lost or gained. There's nothing to attain. And part of why there's nothing to attain may be because the realization of origin and the nature of existence is like the removal of many veils, each one of which structures the illusion, the dreaming, the awareness, to produce a seemingly solid waking world of our experience. So my insight was that insight is that which brings things back into union and demonstrates their relatedness in a new and astonishing, fascinating, intelligent, 
and often ecstatically beautiful way. An intellect can lead to insight, but it prefers that which can be grasped. And for something to be grasped, it has to be separable, and therefore cuts must be made. And how we make these cuts and the purposes for which we use the knife determine the capacities of our human awareness and intelligence and perhaps our destinies. So my little insight was about the nature of insight. A bit like my eyes seeing the photograph of my optic nerve, except that the photograph is a representation. An insight is almost the opposite of a representation, and sometimes directly the opposite of a representation, the actual opposite. And this is important, this last little feature, because representations are toys. And when they appear as the real, then we are in delusion. It occurs to me that dreaming is a form of insight activity for many of us because it, <clears throat> it softens the distinctions that intellect would otherwise impose and merges them together in ways that were common to our experience as little children, but become less common for most of us as we grow older. And the repercussions of enlanguaging and enculturation have their way with our minds. And it also occurs to me that our waking experience is a highly structured mode of something that resembles dreaming, or perhaps is even the same faculty, but is limited in ways that are difficult for me to describe easily. More highly structured by the I call it the persistence of vision, right? The persistence of the, the world. The tree that was in front of my house last night, I fall asleep, it disappears, I awaken, there is the tree again, right? The persistence of, the seeming persistence of the predictable structure, the familiar structure of the material world in our ordinary waking consciousness. Now, there are many ways to transform that consciousness so that novel aspects of the seemingly concrete material world emerge to our awareness, but that's a topic for another time. Thank you for joining me. I'm grateful to learn together. And I look forward to another walk sometime very soon. Bye-bye for now.